Well, good morning, Providence. The fourth Sunday of Advent. What a special Sunday this always is. Generally, this Sunday falls on or near the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year. It's also the last Sunday that God's people gather together before celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, whose birth gave birth to all the redeemed. So, on this Sunday, isn't it fitting that it's the shortest day of the year, and so on the day when the, the uh, world of light is most lacking, that God's people gather to worship the light of the world. Let us then stand together and sing, Joy to the world, the Lord, amen, is come. Hymn number 270, let us stand and sing. Christ child into our lives. We're thankful for this season of the year that we have the opportunity and, and are able to celebrate uh, that birth again, uh, even after all of these years and uh, all of the millennia that has gone by, we still celebrate it afresh and new because our Savior lives today. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the redemptive power that that brings to each of us each and every day. And, oh God, for this time that we spend together worshiping today, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins and our transgressions, the things, oh God, that separate us out from you. In these moments, we pray that you would forgive us and restore us to that right relationship, that we might truly worship and serve you in these moments, that we might hear a word from you, that you might teach us and lead us, nurture us from your word and feed us, and that we might truly worship you and lift our hearts in praise to you today. Lord, we ask all this and pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, again, good morning and Merry Christmas. And we're delighted that you're here this morning and a number of you are visiting with us today and we welcome you. You're not just a visitor with us, but you're our warmly welcome guest, and we are delighted that you're here. And if you are visiting for the first time, or if this is the first time 
in a long time or perhaps you're visiting family for Christmas. Uh, let us know that by uh, filling out a visitor's card for us and putting that in the offering plate as it goes by so that we can have an opportunity to respond to that visit today. And if you, uh, home folks, if you've not had a chance to speak to all of our visitors this morning during our fellowship time, it's a wonderful time to do that. And so as uh, Lara begins to play and Sean comes to lead us, uh, and as we uh, fellowship together and begin our uh, praise songs, this is a wonderful time to do that. Brother Sean? Let us stand once again and sing Emmanuel. with us, Emmanuel. We are a chosen people. I think a lot of times people in the church forget that, that we are chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, and that does mean something. Let us rejoice together. Rejoice, rejoice. rejoicing we shout and sing Hosanna Hosanna in the highest Hosanna 
seated Those who are in, uh, in battle zones and in harm's way. The families of the Lord 
who have concerns and worries about them and who miss them this holiday season. Lord, we just pray for them for your comfort and grace to be with them. Lord, for those wounded warriors who come home with so many battle scars. Lord, we just ask you, Lord God, to, to nurture in those lives and to help us to find ways to minister to them. Lord, we continue to pray for this day, for this service, and for our time together that your will and your work might be done. We yield it all to you, and we do that in Jesus' name, and for his sake, and my name. Well, again, just a few things as our praise team comes down that uh, we need to consider. Uh, this evening, uh, we will not have regular worship services, but uh, our Christmas play, our children are going to uh, uh, present the Christmas play with the help from two adults, and we just encourage you to be here for that this evening, the King's birthday. Don't want you to miss that wonderful event uh, tonight, and uh, just a word to all of those of you who have uh, singing or speaking parts, please be here uh, at around 4.30. And then uh, for the little ones, um, he, if you'll just come along, uh, if you don't have a speaking part, just a movie part, if you can come along around 5.15, uh, that would be a good, a good amount of time for you to get your, get in your costumes and get ready. So uh, speaking and singing about 4.30, and then our other little folks, if you could be here around, uh, around 5.15. The other announcements are as printed in the bulletin, please be uh, mindful of those and read those very carefully and be uh, at your appointed place at the appointed time. Are there any other announcements that need to come to our attention? Mr. Elvin, yes sir. Anybody that's going to help us uh, Christmas Day would like to be here at 11 o'clock and uh, we do need a few more desserts. I, uh, I think maybe so many people may be planning to make something that didn't signed up and uh, we are need a few more Okay. But uh, if everybody can be here at 11 o'clock, we'll get started. Okay, thank, thank you. For our Christmas Day lunch, Evan was saying if you can be here around 11 o'clock if you're helping to serve or, or a runner, and we do need just a few more sign-ups for dessert. So if you haven't signed up and you can give us a dessert on Christmas Day to help us with that meal for those in our community who may not have uh, quite the means that uh, many of us have or others who are going to be uh, in town. Uh, uh, perhaps some of our military young men and women who can't get home for Christmas uh, will have an opportunity to come and eat with the family group. So uh, just a few more desserts. If you could just check the board and help us with that. We need to have those here right around 11 o'clock too. Right, Evan? Yeah. And also, Preston, I didn't mention, I'm sorry, but if you know anybody's in need that uh, we can take a meal to or that can come and eat with us, uh, if it was a shut-in, we'd be glad to take them to the Yeah. Thank you. Just let us know. Just let us know if you know of anyone. Any others? Well, Sean. For our offertory hymn, let us sing Good Christian Men Rejoice, hymn number 273. Please remain seated, though.
voor u in het verhaal voor het Paul, ik heb u gelijk verwacht voor het
the creator of all would give up his life and send us his son to die for you and me to break all our chains and our bonds and set us free in the light of the stars lies the ages both near and far no longer alone this babe will make us new so with our last breath we'll sing only for you here on this night this beautiful night the stars they are shining they're shining so bright heavenly choir sing a sweet melody a perfect lullaby for a perfect baby coming down I believe Mr. Bob is up and about in the back and that means Children's Church is headed out the door with him and while they're doing that if you would turn to the book of Matthew <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2 verses uh, 13 through 23 Matthew chapter 2 verses 13 to 22, uh, 23. And if you were one of the six or eight of us that were in Sunday school with Brother Norman this morning, you'll know that this is a follow-up scripture to that. We're taking sort of where we left off in Matthew chapter 2, beginning with the 13th verse. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up and took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, 
Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all of the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. And then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up and took the child and his mother and went up to the land of Israel. But when he heard that uh, Archelaus was reigning, uh, or Archelaus, excuse me, was reigning in Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said to the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Will you bow with me as we pray together? Well, God, we just pray your blessings on this scripture and to our hearing. And as we consider it these few moments, that you would bless our hearts with your word and with your message and your voice. We do that in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, I think that maybe one of the greatest emotional entrapments, and I think it probably is an entrapment that causes a great deal of depression this time of year, but one of the greatest emotional entrapments is the longing and the expectation of what we believe the ideal Christmas ought to be and ought to look like. What, what should the perfect Christmas be? As I think about it, and I wonder, is there anyone who actually experiences a perfect Christmas? Maybe some of us get close once in a while, but do any of us really uh, have that fantasy Christmas that we all uh, see in Courier and Ives and on the movies on TV? You know, the one where the children never get sick, the Christmas where people never lose their jobs, where there's always enough money, well, everybody in the family is alive and well, and we're missing no one. Well, the truth that we all know all too well is that trouble does not take a, a holiday during the Christmas season. And that shouldn't surprise any of us. Because the first Christmas was anything but a picture-perfect Christmas. In the midst of all of the miracles and all of the joy, there was a lot of difficulty and a lot of hardship. There was a lot of hurting that first Christmas. In our scripture this morning, in the book of Matthew, Matthew shares with us in chapter 2 and chronicles for us much of the hurting and the hope of Christmas. Christmas can often be a time that's full of hassles. Things happen to us that we really didn't expect that we really don't need and we really don't want. If you look at there in verses 13 through 15, where the angel of the Lord had appeared to Joseph in a dream, and he said, get up and take uh, the, the mother and the child and escape to Egypt, and because uh, Herod uh, is about to kill him. And on and on, the list goes of things there in that scripture that just absolutely... Uh, um, is icing on the cake, almost, as it were, in the hassles that Joseph has experienced during the birth of the child Jesus. In 1843, Charles Dickens wrote these words uh, into the mouth of Ebenezer Scrooge uh, in his classic, A Christmas Carol. Ebenezer Scrooge says these words. He says, if I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly in his heart. Well, far too often, we, like Ebenezer Scrooge, complain and grumble about the times in our lives when Christmas just isn't the most picture-perfect experience. It isn't the hallmark experience that we expect and that we imagine that it's going to be. Christmas costs too much. 
We spend way too much time shopping and decorating and too much time stressing out and trying to get everything done, complaining and grumbling and gripling. But in the midst of all of that, we forget what a difficult time the first Christmas actually was, the first event with Mary and Joseph. You see, first of all, there was the problem with Mary's pregnancy. Joseph and Mary were betrothed, even though they were not officially married. Joseph was ready to call the whole thing off now. He was, uh, he was done with Mary because of this news that had come to him. But an angel came and explained the situation to him. Imagine what Mary in those days and, and the kind of righteous people and the good people that Mary was raised by and lived among. We're told that those people were righteous people, that Joseph was a righteous man. Well, imagine what kind of things that Mary endured as an unwed mother. The difficulty of trying to be wed to this man. The whispers and the guessing and the accusations that were, uh, that were shadowed about her. Why in the world would Joseph who is a righteous man, do such a thing to this girl? Or what in the world was this nice girl Mary thinking? Why, I can't imagine a girl like Mary doing this. But even then, amidst all of that and trying to deal with it, it's just beginning because it's not long after the wedding takes place and the birth of Jesus is about to take place, that the emperor all of a sudden decides that everybody needs to go back to his place of birth and he needs to be taxed. Now isn't that with the new year coming and all of us about to file our taxes, isn't that just what we want to hear from Washington is that we've got a new tax coming? And worse than that, do you want to hear, and many of you are from other places, and isn't it that what you want to hear that uh, at, at the most inconvenient time of the year that you've got to go home to the place you were born and gather up all of your records and register in that place. A bill that Joseph hadn't planned on paying, a trip he hadn't planned on taking, and here his wife is, right ready to give birth. And this extra expense of a trip that he needs to take across a very difficult and barren land with a wife that's about to give birth. And, and Joseph ends up having to settle once he gets to Bethlehem for the only accommodations that he can find. Oftentimes we take and, and romanticize this story as we think of the beauty of the nativity, as we think of the wonder and the majesty and the miracle of the birth of this child. But we have to understand that this child was born in the best accommodations that his parents could find in a dirty stable surrounded by stinking animals. There was no doctor. There was no nurse. There was no epidural for Mary. Mary gave birth. And in the end, it all came out just fine. Everything turned out okay. The baby was perfectly healthy. And they wrapped him uh, all up in a towel or in a blanket and laid him in a manger. But then again, not long, it strikes again. By the time we get to our scripture this morning in verse 13, verse 13 says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. The baby has been born and all, uh, all over again. Joseph is having to face difficulties. This records the, that Jesus is born and an angel brings this message to Joseph. Get up and take Mary to Egypt because now King Herod, that beast of a king, is going to try to kill this child and murder this baby. So over and over and over again, Mary and Joseph endure one hardship right after the other. They endure obstacle after obstacle and all for the sake of their new baby. But I want you to notice that on every turn, and where there is every hassle, and where there is every obstacle, holy God is right there. When Joseph doesn't understand, when he is about to put Mary away privately and divorce her, an angel is sent by God to reassure him. 
and then somehow funds become available for him to make that trip to Bethlehem. Because while you don't have to put gas in a donkey, you do have to keep them alive. So there, is, there was a, a, a cost at traveling across that hard and barren land. And according to his plan, God provides a place, not according to our plan, not how you and I think it ought to be done, not how Mo, uh, Mary and Joseph uh, think it ought to be done, but in the mystery of God's plan and God's time, he provides a place for them to stay and a place for the child to be born in a lowly stable. And then he sends wise men who leave with Mary and Joseph expensive gifts. And in days gone by, I thought, you know, what, what in the world did Mary and Joseph do with those gifts of Jesus that the wise men would have brought? But they would have been perfect gifts to finance the rescue of Jesus from Herod, who was about to kill all of the children. So over and over and over, while there is one hardship right after the other, one hassle right after the other, there is also one reminder right after the other that God never left their side through the entire event, nor does he us. He does the same thing for you and I. No matter what the hassle is, he never leaves us. And he never forsakes us. He's not Santa Claus. He doesn't bring us magical toys and gifts. He doesn't give us a plush hotel to be born in. Sometimes there's a mystery in God's plan that we don't understand. But he never, ever forsakes us. He always gives us what we need when we ask it of him. He doesn't move out of our way every obstacle that comes to us. He doesn't take away from us every hassle of life that may come. But he gives us the grace that he gave to Paul when Paul said, My grace, your grace, is sufficient for me. He gives us the same courage, the same ability, and the same grace that he gave David when David wrote these words in Psalm chapter 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in time of trouble. I wonder this morning what your struggles in life are. What's standing in the road in front of you? Because Christmas can be full of hassles and hardships, just like life is full of hassles and hardships. What's stopping you this morning from experiencing the, the perfect Christmas, from getting your life where it needs to be. Well, not only are there hassles in life, but there's pain and hurt and disappointment and disillusionment. In verses 16 through 18, you see Herod, if you look there in that scripture and kind of uh, skim along with me there, you can see that Herod in verse 16 began to realize that he had been outwitted by the Magi. That they had tricked him. That somehow they slipped out of Judea under cover of night and, and his spies didn't catch them. And he was absolutely furious. And in that fit of anger that was so characteristic of that beast of a king, Herod, he had an order sent out that in the, in the, in the vicinity of Bethlehem, all of the boys who were two years old and under uh, would be killed. A horrible, horrible thing to have happen. So hurt and injury and pain do not take a holiday. For many people, some of you this morning sitting here, Christmas is a painful time of year. Sometimes it's the grief of missing that loved one that you long so badly to have back with you on this special occasion. There's an extra place at the table that's not filled this year. Sometimes it's living in a sick or handicapped body that gives you pain every day that robs you of the joy of everything that you do. And in this special time of year, probably more than most, we remember that there are young men and women on the field of battle far from us. And they're away from us and away from their families and their families miss them. And they will bow this Christmas season in the loneliness. 
and the despair of being away from their families. Christmas cannot be only be full of hassles, but it can also be full of pain and hurt. Lord, why in the world would you allow such pain and heartache on Christmas? But the truth is, Christmas has always been full of hurt and pain ever since Jesus was born. The particular pain in this story we see comes after Joseph and Mary leave Bethlehem. And there in verse 18, if you look in verse 18, that is, a, that is probably one of the most famous scriptures uh, in the Bible. It's probably a scripture that is set to music as much as most, and yet it's one of the greatest horror stories that the Bible records, and oftentimes we just kind of overlook it. You see, Herod had tried to fool the wise men into showing him where the king of the Jews would be born so he could eliminate any competitors for his throne. You see, Herod was under the mistaken identity that he was going to live forever, somehow. When he figures out that the wise men have fooled him, that they've tricked him, it sends him into one of his character, characteristic tirades and rages. And of course, he orders that the troops kill all those children in, in and around Bethlehem. And he sends them on a special mission to do that. And you see the soldiers, as they arrive there in Bethlehem and in that community, they see the fear and the anxiety on the faces of the people as they ride in. Nobody really knows for sure why the Roman soldiers are here, but it's never been a good thing, and they know that today is no different. And perhaps uh, the Roman soldiers begin to round up all of the children and the families, and then they begin to sort out those families who have children who are young men, uh, boys who are age two and under. Can you imagine if that were your family and you were in that situation and soldiers came today and you had a grandchild or a child who was under two years old and your family got sorted out because of that and then that child was taken away from you and the scripture records a story in verse 18 that is so filled with horror and so filled with bloodshed that I cannot even bear to speak of it as I read that scripture. The scene in verse, six, in verse 16 is, uh, through 18 is filled with such horror. And there's so many questions that for me as I read that, that are left unanswered. And I suspect that I'm no different from anybody else. Lord, why in the world didn't you send an angel to all of those families? Why couldn't we have saved those children of those mothers who were in Bethlehem? Lord, why didn't you strike down Herod before he had the opportunity to kill those, those children and to do such a horrible thing? Why in the world, oh God, do you allow such pain and suffering and death at the birth of your son? I don't know if you've ever wondered any of these questions as you read this story or not, but I imagine that these mothers of Bethlehem and that greater community wondered many days why something couldn't have been done. Why would God allow such pain and suffering, such devastation and death, especially on the occasion of the birth of his son? And I, like so many others who read the scriptures and ponder over them, wish I had a good, clean, clear, crisp answer for you this morning. But you know what? I could answer it to its very perfection and I could not rob from those women the hurt that they felt at the loss of their children. I don't have all the answers, and even if I did, my answers couldn't heal their hurt. And my answers can't heal your hurt this morning and your pain. But all I know is, is that God makes a promise to us. I don't understand so much of what happens to us in this world, but I do know what God's promises are. And he promises never to leave us or forsake us. David, the great psalmist, wrote in Psalm 34, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and save such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Where are you, Lord, when I'm hurting this Christmas season? I'm right here, my child. I haven't left you. Why well, We don't understand why there's such pain and suffering and heartache, but we know this, that the great God of the universe loves us. 
And while there is pain and suffering now, there is hope. Verses 19 through 23, if you kind of skim down those verses, that's the light that comes on with the shadow of hope beginning to glimmer through. Somebody has said that we can live 40 days without food. We can live about eight days without water. And we can live about four minutes without air, but we can't live for a few seconds without hope. But you know, as I ponder that, the, the older I get, the more I disagree with that statement. I don't think that's a true statement because I see plenty of people, uh, maybe some of you out there this morning, who live a lot longer, days, months, years, without hope. We can live decades bearing the heavy burden of shame and disgrace and the guilt of wrong choices with no hope, no peace for the forgiveness of sin. People can spend all of their lives searching for something, looking for meaning, hoping for direction, trying to find purpose. People can live and die in this world for 60, 70, 80, 100 years with absolutely no hope that they'll ever live again and draw another peaceful breath in another life. But nobody, nobody this morning with all of the hurt, with all of the hassle, with all of the imperfections that this world brings us this Christmas season, nobody has to live without hope. You don't have to live without hope and I don't have to live without hope. We may have to endure the hurts and sorrows, the obstacles and the hassles of everyday life in this world. We may not get to the perfect Christmas, but that little boy in Bethlehem, that baby that was born in Bethlehem, who grew up and lived in Nazareth, who was snatched from the jaws of Herod and from death, offers you and I hope this morning beyond our wildest dreams and our most vivid imagination. Because he lives today, you and I have the hope of glory and of redemption. Verse 19 tells us that the hope is this baby who outlived the wicked King Herod who tried to kill him. But then he freely gave his life up one day when he was about 33 years old. And because of that, this morning, this Christ child has become our Savior. He's become our Emmanuel Redeemer, God with us who saves us and keeps us eternally. And he invites you this morning, if you've never come to him, if you don't have that hope this morning, if you don't have him this morning in your life, you have no hope. You have missed it all. And hope, in spite of all of the pain, and all of the obstacles and beyond all of the hurting, hope you can find right now comes in this Christ child by bowing and believing in him and accepting him as your Lord and Savior. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, you've missed the hope of glory. The hassles, the hurting and this pain uh, of life that we live every day is just another day. It's just another way on the way to a greater torment than we can ever imagine. But none of that has to be without hope. Not, none of it has to be without eternal hope given to us through that boy who was born in Bethlehem. This morning, I urge you to come to him. Maybe this morning you need to come and recommit your life. Maybe you need to rededicate your life to this child who was born, who lived, who gave his life for you, that you might live eternally. Or maybe God is calling you to membership in this church. Whatever your need as Brother Norman, Brother Sean, come and um, lead us now. Whatever your need is this morning, I invite you to come as we sing our closing hymn. Let us stand together. Number 250 in the hymnal. O little town of Bethlehem, the king is born, but is he reigning in your life today? Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how 
how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light the hopes and the fears of all the years are met in thee tonight verse 4 O holy child of Bethlehem descend on us we pray cast out our sin and enter in be born in in us today we hear the Christmas angels the great glad tidings tell oh come to us abide with us our Lord Emmanuel I'm going to ask you if you would just for a moment to be seated Are you hiding in the piano? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have something to say? No, no, you go I always have something to say. Where's <laughs> Sean? And she's out. She's out. Would you come and have some Christmas spirit that you'd like to give to me? Do you have a great holiday? Thank you very much. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. And we appreciate all that uh, Sean and Lara do and the music that they provide and help us live through the years. And we wish them and their family Merry Christmas. With that, I ask you to stand with all hearts clear. I want to ask both bands. Can you wish you good Our Father, we thank you so much for this time that we have had to come to give this morning to uh, worship you. Lift up the name of Jesus here about the story. Thank you for the opportunity and being raised up here on earth and for doing and dying for our sins that we might have life and have life here at Just praise Him and glorify Him. And if all those we have our separate ways, just pray for that you do each one of us and may we return to that. <coughs> <coughs> 